So Jacob and Esau are born in almost the exact middle of the 50 chapters of the book of Genesis. And I don't think that placement is a coincidence. The material that makes up the narratives in Genesis about Abraham and his family come from at least four different traditions. And while each of those traditions is very old, those who assembled those ancient stories into the book we now call Genesis came later, and they wove those traditions together in a conscious way, choosing the order and placement of the stories within it to make the underlying message easier to find and grasp. So as we talk about choices, someone made the choice that the very center of Genesis would be the birth of Jacob and Esau, likely because their story makes an essential turning point, not just in Genesis, but in the entire Bible. The initial stories in Genesis begin with the widest possible lens. We hear the stories of creation. We visit the first humans. We hear the stories that try to explain why the world is the way it is how civilizations started, why pain exists, why there are different peoples in different places on the earth and why they can't communicate with each other. We also begin to learn about the nature of God, God's intentions regarding the world and all that's in it and how God and creation will interact. God's first covenant is made not only with Noah and his family, but with all living things affirming that God is the God of all, human and non-human, anything on, under, or above the earth. God is willing to directly interact with it, too. The God of Genesis is not the clockmaker who sets the time and just lets things run, but God is also not the micromanager who makes creation simply act out of a pre-written play. This is the God who invites Adam to come up with the names for all the animals. And even when Adam and Eve break the one rule in the garden, you only had one job, one rule, and they break it, God still makes them clothing so that they can be less vulnerable in their new and more painful reality. In Genesis 12, the lens changes from that very wide angle and zooms in to one family in particular, the family of Abraham. The promise God makes to Abraham is still that all the families of the earth will be blessed, but through him. God and God's blessings are still intended for all, but God promises Abraham that the instrument of that universal blessing is going to come from his particular family. Abraham's firstborn, Ishmael, is blessed by God and receives a substantial promise for his future. But to Abraham's surprise, God chooses Abraham's second son, Isaac, to be the instrument of the worldwide blessing God has promised going forward. That's not how societies worked in Abraham's day. The eldest son was the most important. So we take note. God does not always choose the people or methods that we would have chosen. If we're paying attention, we'll see the pattern of God making unorthodox choices continue through the Bible. And very frequently, it's God choosing the younger over the elder in a family. The younger Isaac gets to carry the promise, and that reversal continues in God's choice of Jacob, who's technically a minute or two younger than his twin brother Esau. And to prove that we're supposed to pay attention to that, we have the story here in the very center of Genesis and in God's words to Rebekah, the elder shall serve the younger. Human power structures are inverted by God not just once, but again and again and again. But the practice of God specifically picking just one of the sons from each of Abraham's descendants comes to an end here. Jacob is the last one in that system. When referring to the Israelite God, the Bible frequently uses the phrase, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
But Jacob did not die childless. As we learn across the rest of Genesis, Jacob will eventually have 12 sons. For the first time, however, God does not choose just one of Jacob's 12 sons to carry the promise. Instead, God chooses all of them. If you fast forward to chapter 32, you'll find the story of Jacob wrestling with God in the form of an angel at the ford of the Jabbok River. We'll come back to this later, but remarkably, Jacob wins that wrestling match. And in recognition of that victory, God changes Jacob's name to Israel. And it's Israel's 12 sons whose descendants become the 12 tribes of Israel and become the subject of all the rest of the stories of the Bible. So in the exact middle of Genesis, we're brought all the way into the womb to witness the struggle and literal birth of Israel. That means the symbolism here is critical to understanding everything that comes afterwards, not just in Genesis, but across every chapter of every book of the Bible. Again, God's words to Rebecca make it plain. These are not just two bickering children. This is the birth of two nations whose peoples will be divided, and the one you might expect to rule is going to end up serving instead. Those first five verses of the chapter of this passage summarize the story that will play out in the second half of Genesis and give us the lens to read those stories. The struggle between Jacob and Esau represents the struggle between Israel and their surrounding kin. When Esau wants some of that red stew, he's called Edom, which is a neighboring nation and struggle. So the, the fact that we are talking about nations here is right there in God's first words about um, what's, what's going on inside of Rebecca. In showing us that larger struggle through the lens of difficult family dynamics, we find both our challenge and our hope. But to find it, we need to follow the clues right there in the text and read it on multiple levels. One level is a story of a family with severe difficulties, betrayals, and broken relationships. Another is the story of Israel and their extended family who also experience those things. And a third is the story of all of us, since in the largest sense, the Bible is bringing us the story of how God works in and through particular people in identifiable times and places to bless the world and all who dwell therein. So given all of that, what does this story offer to us? The notes in every Bible will tell you that the name Jacob literally means heel grabber. It's sometimes morphed over into usurper, but the, liter the literal words are a heel grabber, which is a description of how the twins came out of the womb. Esau is born first, but grabbing at his heel on the way out is Jacob trying to be first, trying even before his first breath to usurp his brother's firstborn advantage. Struggle is central to the story of Jacob and is therefore central to the stories of Israel and to all of us. More than that, the struggle is not something that comes later in life because of something that happens. Even in the womb, there is struggle. As you know, I'm not a big fan of the Christian doctrine of original sin, at least in the way that it's typically applied. I think a more helpful way to view the idea is offered in these verses. What greets us at conception is struggle. And what we gain at our first breath is the ability to make choices during our struggles that will shape our lives and help us respond to the struggles going on within us and around us. And all that happens in all the layers that this story touches. 
The strong struggles with what is weak, with what is weak in ourselves, in our families, in our nations, in our world. The elder struggles with the younger. Our aging bodies struggle with our younger mind and what it would prefer to be doing. <laughs> Parents struggle with their children. Gen Z struggles with the boomers. In such circumstances, it is easy to become a heel grabber, to reach for what we want without regard for the potential impact and response to our choices, because we're struggling. Just that much of the story, the fact that Jacob and Esau are struggling inside the womb and as they exit the birth canal, should prepare us for what we find in the Bible. Because the story of Jacob is the story of Israel. If you wade into the Bible thinking you're going to get a collection of guidepost stories, I have some unfortunate news. This is the story of struggle, the struggle to make choices that will help rather than hurt, and to figure out whether helping ourselves while hurting others is in the end a winning proposition or not. But the story of Jacob and Esau moves forward from their birth, and in this heel-grabbing world, there are still choices to be made that might make it better or worse or who knows what. God still wants to bless all the families of the earth and to do it through human agency. We might wish that God would just pull out some of that supposed omnipotence and put just a stop to all the horrors once and for all. But God is love. And the one necessary condition for love is freedom. We have to learn to choose love. We have to be willing to choose the blessing offered to us on its own terms and conditions. That's a struggle. And the story of Jacob and Esau shows that the struggle gets worse before it gets better. But here at the beginning of the story, there actually doesn't have to be a conflict. It all hinges on the choices the brothers make when Esau returns from a hunting trip hungry. Esau comes home while Jacob is cooking lentil stew. He says he's famished. He asks for some of the food. In a healthy relationship, Jacob would have given it to him and maybe asked how his trip went. I don't know. But Jacob makes a different choice. Jacob is not going to just give his brother food. He chooses instead to sell his brother food. But we're not talking about a couple of small coins from his allowance or doing some extra chores. What Jacob wants as his price for the stew is Esau's birthright. So what's a birthright? The birthright in ancient Israel was the promise of a double portion of the father's inheritance. And it was almost always given to the oldest son in the family. So Isaac's father is Abraham, and by the end of Abraham's life, he was extremely wealthy. The Bible tells us that 100% of Abraham's inheritance went to Isaac. Isaac has just two children. So the birthright, the double portion that Jacob is demanding in exchange for a bowl of lentils, is a very steep price. Esau, for his part, is a kid we have all met somewhere along the line. Asked to give up something he does not know how to value and can't see or touch or count, he responds, I'm about to die. What use is a birthright to me? I'm hungry. Give me the food. Jacob, however, knows exactly what use a birthright is, and he's savvy enough to do the equivalent of getting that deal in writing. He asks Esau for an oath to seal the agreement. That level of seriousness should have shaken Esau into his senses. But it doesn't, and the transaction is made. Esau gets his food. Jacob gets the birthright. 
That kind of dealing, where only one side truly understands what's at stake, happens many times a day in places from back alleys to corporate boardrooms to the halls of governments around the globe. And when a person or nation discovers what they have really signed away, resentments build and larger conflicts become more likely. But reading the fine print is a struggle. Hammering out a deal that respects the needs of all sides is a struggle. Thinking through potential, potential consequences of our actions is a struggle. So we too often take the fastest route to what we want. We sell the birthright for a bit of soup, or we take advantage of another's weakness to rob them blind. In doing so, we open the door for the struggle to become a life-threatening war. In the Jacob and Esau story, that happens two chapters later. Isaac is drawing near to the end of his life, and he prepares to offer the one remaining thing that he still is able to give to his eldest son, a blessing. Traditionally, every son got a blessing, but like with the birthright inheritance, the blessing for the eldest son was the best by an order of magnitude. Further, blessings, and curses for that matter, were seen as sort of a combination of prayer and prophecy. The blessing wasn't just one person wishing another well. The blessing was believed to have the power to bring those wishes and promises and prophecies to pass. And once pronounced, neither blessings nor curses could be altered or taken back. Isaac is old and blind. He knows he could go at any time. So he begins the ritual of blessing for Esau by asking Esau to do something for him, to go out hunting, bring Isaac his favorite game, prepare it just the way he likes to eat it, and bring him the meal, and then Isaac will give Jacob, will give Esau the blessing. And here, the conflict between the brothers escalates, and its actual betrayals and theft begin. Rebecca's favorite child is Jacob, not Esau. Isaac's favorite is Esau, the parents play in favorites, um, but Rebecca wants Jacob to have everything. She hears that the blessing is about to occur and wants it to go to her favorite son instead. So she tells Jacob to go butcher a couple of animals from their own flocks and says she will prepare the meal. She knows just how, how Isaac likes it. They'll never be able to tell it's a goat and not wild game. She'll She'll take care of all of that. Um, and Jacob, Isaac will never know the difference. Jacob points out that even though Isaac is blind, he will touch Jacob for the blessing. And Esau has way more body hair than Jacob. Jacob is afraid he's going to be discovered when, Esau, when Isaac touches him and then would actually get a curse instead of a blessing for the deception. Rebecca has a solution for that too, and fixes some animal skins to wrap around Jacob to fool her husband. Since Esau is out hunting and Jacob needs to just go to the backyard to get the meat, Jacob is ready first, brings the prepared meal to his father and the ruse works. Jacob gets both the extra special blessing and the double inheritance, and he is out the door just as Esau comes in with his freshly caught game. And then it's discovered. The Bible tells us that Isaac trembles violently when he discovers the deception, and Esau screams in grief and rage, but it can't be undone. Esau's rage grows, and he plots to murder Jacob. Rebekah finds that out too, and decides that Jacob needs a trip to her brother's house in a country far to the north, while things sort of calm down around the house. He does go there, 
and the twins do not meet again until decades later. We encounter them and they encounter each other at last in chapter 32, when Jacob thinks that surely, after all of these years, Esau must be over it by now and tries to come home with an entourage of multiple wives, many children, and thousands upon thousands of animals. But Esau has not gotten over it and goes out to meet his brother with 400 armed men. They draw close, separated only by the Jabbok River, a small tributary that empties into the Jordan near Israel's northern border. At night, Jacob steps into the ford of the Jabbok River alone. And a divine figure, not clear whether it's an angel or God in some form, wrestles with Jacob throughout the night. Come morning, the angel declares that Jacob has, quote, wrestled with God and won and gives him a blessing and a new name. The new name is Israel, which means either the one who strives with God or God strives. Hebrew is delightfully imprecise. And since both Jacob and God were striving with each other in the ford of the Jabbok River, either meaning fits. And it fits both the immediate context as well as the theme of every story in every book of the Bible that follows, right on through Old and New Testaments to the book of Revelation. People striving with God and God striving with people. Every story in the Bible could be characterized as one or the other and often both. When Jacob goes out from the encounter with the angel, crosses the river, and meets his twin. Jacob is changed. He has indeed won the struggle with God. He has won a new name and a new way of interacting with his family and the world. Instead of war, the brothers embrace. And Jacob says that to see his brother's face is like seeing the face of God. A condensed version of the Jacob and Esau story would look an awful lot like Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. It looks an awful lot like being saved, like having your heart strangely warmed by creating at least a little corner of the beloved community. The life of Jacob, when it comes to an end in Genesis 50, the very last chapter of the book, is a microcosm of the history of Israel which is itself told to show us the truth about God's nature, God's expectations of us, and how living according to those expectations can, over time, bring blessing and peace to all the families of the earth. But the story is not one where that blessing comes easily, even to those who carry it, let alone to those who they're charged to share it with. Jacob does finally gain the only blessing that really matters, God's blessing. But even so, even with the hugs all around and the weapons left unused, Jacob and Esau return to different homes. They come together one last time to bury Isaac in chapter 35, but they don't ever become close. And their descendants make different choices and are frequently at war. How long will this go on? For as long as it takes. With every new birth, the struggle is engaged. And every choice has the opportunity to make it either easier or harder for God's blessing to be passed along. But Jacob's story teaches us that the way forward in our struggle is to shift from our pattern of heel grabbing and step into the ford of the Jabbok River where we strive with God and allow God to strive with us until morning dawns and shows us a different world than we were able to see from the other side of the river. Our heel-grabbing choices will leave their mark. 
Jacob came away from that wrestling match with a blessing and a new name, but also with a limp. And so do we. But the blessing pulls us forward across the river anyway. Still as beloved of God as we were at our struggling birth, still able to help God bless the struggling world, even if we're not the oldest or the strongest or the one who always gets a double portion of everything. The struggle is not our punishment. It's our calling. Amen. <laughs>